Hey, good morning church or afternoon or just whenever you're getting to watch this. We've been in a series on the life of David, an awesome character in the Bible. And you know, if you're just getting to start these today, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 19, um, which is a very, very eventful moment in David's life. Um, to say the least. And, you know, I would like to say that I'm a lot like David. I, I wish I had the honor to say that, you know, he was described as a man after God's own heart. Uh, and he he wrote so many of the Psalms and he just had this passion and this zeal for God. And, and I hope that people can say that about me someday. Um, but this chapter, not necessarily one of the situ situations that I would want to be in um, that David was in. Uh, so essentially this he had had a roller coaster of a life up to this point. I mean when you think about a, a lowly shepherd who's the youngest uh, of all his brothers that you know when the prophet came to town he wasn't even invited to the dinner. And then at that same event like he he got anointed king and then he goes in and defeats Goliath and becomes one of the most famed warriors in all of Israel and has so much honor and esteem and goes and lives with the king and marries the king's daughter, becomes the king's um, son-in-law, all while waiting, knowing that he's the next king. And, and so he's just been on this, this uptrend. And then all of a sudden in this story, something snaps in Saul. The, the current king and Saul tries to kill David. And so it's just this roller coaster of uh, his life has been going up and up and up and up and up. And then all of a sudden this curveball gets thrown at him of if you were to read everything that had happened and knew that that he was the next king, you would have never expected the life to change in this dramatic of a way especially when you go back a few chapters, when he was anointed king. God didn't say, oh, you're going to be a king, but you're gonna go through all these trials before it happens. He just said, this is the next king of Israel. And it's just an insane situation because it's repeated twice in this chapter alone. And it's not the only time for the rest of 1 Samuel that this, this same cycle gets repeated with David and Saul. In verse 2, it says, And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Which, can you even imagine being in a situation that Jonathan was arguably David's best friend? Could you imagine being in that situation of your best friend his dad wants to kill you like that. That's not even a fathomable thing to me. Uh, and what's crazy is Jonathan actually goes on his behalf and uh, gets his father to agree to let David return and be in the presence of the king and be a servant of the king. And it says in verse seven, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. And there was war again, and David went out and fought the, war, fought the war with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in the house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing in, as David was playing the lyre. And then Saul tries to kill David again. I, I couldn't imagine being in David's shoes here. The humility that he displays to be betrayed the way that he was betrayed and then to come back and not come back in a way of, oh, it's my time now, you failed at this, but come back in a way of, no, I'm still going to serve. Like I couldn't imagine somebody coming to me and, and saying, you're gonna be the next CEO of this massive company. Go clean toilets. But essentially, like that's what David is, is doing here. He, he's taking a lowly role in the presence of the king after he's been told he's going to be king. Like he's just there to serve and to be humble as long as it takes. You don't see him in the coming chapters as we go through this, you don't see him ever 
trying to force his will and force his way into the kingdom. He actually refuses to do that. Instead, he remains in the humble position and just trusts that God is going to do what God says he's going to do, no matter what the roller coaster is. If God has promised it, David knew that it was going to happen. So there's no reason for him to force his hand. And man, that's, that's the same in our lives. Like, what are the things that God has promised to you? And are you trying to force your hand in that? Are you trying to force these things to come about? Or are you just going to be patient and receive the blessings of God when they come? It reminds me of the story of Abraham. And it's something that I go back to quite frequently. But he was promised a son. And we all see that and read that. And it's amazing that Abraham was promised a son. But what a lot of times what we read over, because it's such a short segment, is there were decades that he waited for that promise. And in fact, the, the biggest downfall he had was trying to force the blessing to come by having the son with somebody else. Whereas he, if he would have just waited on the promise, waited on the blessing of God, then it was going to come in its time. And I want to be like David in that. I want to be like David in the way of I'm willing to wait on the blessing of God when it comes, how it comes, and everything that comes with it up until that blessing.